Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at St. Paul's. This morning, today is Christ the King Sunday, and our readings reflect this truth, that our King reigns over all things, and our King is also our Savior, our King is our Shepherd. My sermon will be based on the first lesson from Ezekiel, where Ezekiel speaks about a shepherd over his people who will be a prince. We'll talk about that uh, in the light of this idea that Jesus rules over all things for the good of his church. So again, welcome to our worship. To those who are joining us online, we welcome you as well this morning. Uh, We come before our Lord today with praise and thanksgiving. We open with hymn 227, Come, let us join our cheerful songs. Page 9. to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Jesus Christ, by your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson is from the prophet Ezekiel. That's my sermon text uh, for this morning, so I won't elaborate on it too much, but uh, understand the setting and the circumstances under which it was inspired. Uh, Ezekiel, as I'll mention in my sermon, was a prophet in exile. This prophecy was given at a time when God's people were in exile. Uh, so it speaks to those present circumstances, but it also seeks, speaks to a future promise. And without getting into the details now, it speaks of promises that would be in the shorter term and in the longer term. Listen to these words of prophecy from Ezekiel. For this is what the Lord God says. Here I am. I myself will seek the welfare of my flock and carefully search for them. As a shepherd searches for his flock when his sheep that were with him have been scattered, so I will search for my flock and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in all the settlements of the land. I will lead them into good pasture, and their grazing land will be on the high mountains of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing land. Excuse me. I myself will shepherd my flock. I, I myself will let them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will shepherd them with justice. Then I will raise up over them one shepherd, and he will tend them. My servant David will tend them, and he will be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be the prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the word of our Lord. We continue with the psalm of the day, Psalm 47, found on page 10.
In our second lesson from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we, we hear how our Savior has been a, put in this position of authority over all things for the good of his church, that his heavenly Father placed everything under his feet, and that includes even the greatest enemy of humankind, death itself. Listen to these words of hope and promise based on the resurrection of Christ through the pen of the Apostle Paul. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came by a man, the resurrection of the dead also is going to come by a man. For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ as the first fruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be done away with. Certainly he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now when it says that all things have been put in subjection, obviously that does not include the one who subjected all things to him. But when all things have been subjected to him, Excuse me. Apologize for that. I'm supposed to have this open. But I want to finish that reading for you. But when all things have been subjected to him, then the Son will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. This is the word of our Lord. We continue with the verse of the day. Alleluia, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alleluia. Alleluia. gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 27. Glory be to you, O Lord. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please join me in confessing together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of the day. It's hymn 375 on page 12.
fellow sheep of the good shepherd, our shepherd king, Jesus. The prophecy of Ezekiel presents us with a lot of challenges of interpretation. Any of you who have read Ezekiel understand that many of it is recorded in apocalyptic and figurative language, and parts of it are downright odd-sounding to our ears. Much of it has the feel of St. John's Revelation. Picture language and symbols are everywhere. At the same time, Ezekiel most definitely is rooted in real facts in the specific history of the people of Israel because Ezekiel was a prophet in exile. He had been taken to Babylon with the other captured citizens of Judah, at least some of them, in 597 B.C. And so he was a shepherd of the Jews at a time when the flock was scattered. The northern kingdom of Israel had already been blown away to Assyria, never to return again as a nation. Judah and Babylon, they would return, but not yet. So it's rooted in history and rich with symbolism. Ezekiel is a prime example or contains prime examples of what has been referred to as the prophetic perspective. Now, what do I mean by that? It means that when God spoke through the ancient prophets, he often gave them visions of future time in sort of a panoramic way. So that when they prophesied, they often witnessed and recorded God's multiple fulfillments to the promises he was making. This morning, as we meditate on God's word, to the Babylonians through Ezekiel, or to the Jews in Babylonia through Ezekiel, we will rejoice in this prophetic perspective because it will help us understand that God's promise to shepherd his people in exile didn't just apply to them. It applies to us, his people today. It's fulfilled among us this morning. In verses 11 and 12 of our text, we see that the first promise God gave his exiled people through this section of his word was that he himself would care for them in exile. He would do it, and that's important because you know that the history of God's people had been a history of bad shepherds, bad kings who had cared little for the flock in comparison to their concern for themselves. Over their history, there had been good kings who had the heart of the Lord as they ruled over the Lord's people, and yet far more of them had been rebellious, unbelieving, selfish, really in it for themselves, interested in preserving their own political power and enriching themselves and lording it over the flock. For them, it was a means of self-advancement. And tragically, this wasn't just true of their kings. It was often very much true of their priests. There were faithful priests, of course, but many of them were not acting as God's loving representatives among the people. They saw their priestly duties as just a, a job, an occupation. This is how they were going to make a living. And Scripture records that many times they revealed that in corruption and how they carried out their jobs. They weren't faithful to God's word in their lives or in their preaching. And so these were truly sad and tragic parts of their history. And it had landed them in a sad and tragic set of circumstances. Here they were, hundreds of miles away from their homeland, wandering the plains of Babylon instead of the valleys of Judah. Worship at the Jerusalem temple was a vague memory, and it was getting vaguer by the day. It looked very much, from an outward glance, like this nation called Israel, this flock of Judah, would lose its identity and fade into the annals of history. But God said, not on my watch. My promises and my purposes will be fulfilled, and that means I will restore my flock. It will happen. Listen again to verses 11 and 12. This is what the Lord God says. I myself will seek the welfare of my flock and examine them carefully. As a shepherd examines his flock when he is with his sheep that have been scattered, so I will examine my flock. He went looking for them and he inspected them. 
The first step to restoring a flock is for the flock to be cared for by a shepherd who actually cares. So if God's under shepherds, those kings and the priests wouldn't do it, he would personally seek their welfare. He would examine that flock that had been scattered as a good shepherd does to find the pests and the parasites among them and remove them. Like a good shepherd, God would determine what was wrong with them and he was going to deal with the most critical issues first. And the first and most critical issue that any flock of God faces is their spiritual welfare. God looked at the Judeans in exile and he saw that the collective faith of the people had over time degraded to the point where their identity as God's people was at risk. And so what did he do? He did something about it. History records what happened in Babylon. Though they had lost the temple, they had lost that formal worship in Jerusalem, that time in Babylon actually served to strengthen the faith of the believing remnant. Because in Babylon, something interesting happened. You saw the first synagogues in the world pop up in Babylon. That tradition of a meeting place to study God's word among the Jews began in Babylon. And so God's word was studied and God raised up prophets like Ezekiel and Daniel who would help the people understand his word and actually give them new words from God which are in our Bibles today. In other words, God took a time of trial or exile and he took and made it a time of blessing for his people, even though it was a time of persecution. He made the faithful remnant become more faithful. He created through his word in them a desire for more spiritual and national restoration that had been lacking. He actually took a bad situation and made it a blessing. He preserved his flock. And what comfort this gives us today, brothers and sisters. As we consider the history of, of our church, of the Lutheran church, of the church at large, and also our present circumstances, God's faithfulness to the believing remnant at the time of the Babylonian exile, that faithfulness has been repeated many times in history since. At the time of the persecution under Nero in the first century, God preserved and strengthened and massively grew the flock of the church, even as many were martyred. At the time of the Reformation, God preserved and strengthened his grace-chosen flock by raising up the reformers to reveal the gospel again in all of its glory. Today, in a society filled with faithless spiritual and political leaders, God is preserving, he is strengthening, he is caring for his flock no less than he has at any other time in history. So we don't need to have fear as a flock, even if that flock is small, because God, your shepherd, is with you. He examines us, he sees what is wrong, and he's working through his spirit. He's working through the means of grace among us to preserve our faith. And that means the external circumstances don't matter if all is well with your soul, and, and it is, all is well with your soul because he's dealt with the greatest problem you've ever faced. The greatest issue we face are not, is not a political issue, it's not an economic issue, it's not a physical issue, it is a spiritual issue. It's that bug, and that parasite we call sin. And our shepherd brings his holy word to us every week in this place to convict you and to heal you. He is constantly reforming us through the, the word. And that is true wherever we live, under whatever circumstances. He cared for them in exile. It was true then, it's true now. When we confess in our creed that we believe in the Holy Christian Church, we're saying that he has promised he will always protect, he will always preserve his people by the gospel. And that will be true until the very last day of this globe on which we live. Secondly, as Ezekiel brought words of hope to the exiles, in exile, he told them something that must have given joy to their souls. Not only would he care for them in exile, he would return them from exile. That was a promise he gave them. He would one day return them to those green pastures and mountainsides of their homeland. Hearts which longed to worship God in his temple again knew 
by God's own promise that one day that temple would be restored and even if they died before it would happen, they knew that God's promise was sure. So if not they, then their children and their grandchildren would experience it. The exile would come to an end by God's grace and it did. Listen to these beautiful words of promise again, verses 13 and 14. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in all the settlements of the land. I will pasture them in good pasture and their grazing land will be on the high mountains of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing land and they will pasture on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. It's very repetitive, but by purpose. On the mountains of Israel, God was saying, you're going to go home, and I will bless you there. We consider how this was fulfilled in history, and it's clear that there was a very literal fulfillment of this prophecy to Judah when God allowed that remnant to return physically after the decree of the Persian leader Cyrus in 539 B.C. Over the century that followed, multiple waves did return under the faithful leadership, as God had promised, of the priest Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, the scribe Ezra. They returned, and the Lord did allow them to grow crops, to raise their families, to worship their God, yes, on the heights of Judah. God had promised to return them, and he kept his promise. And because he kept his promise, it was again possible for that promise of the Jewish Messiah, who would be born in Bethlehem, to be born according to the promise in Bethlehem. But as we read of those idyllic conditions the prophets said they would live under, and we read about the permanency of this kingdom to come, something becomes very evident very quickly. If the return to Judah were the only and final fulfillment of that promise, then God's promise eventually failed. Because although the people returned and they did see a lot of their freedom restored, their return was far from perfect and it wasn't permanent. The the restoration of the city and the temple, it never brought it back to the glory days of, of King David. There were years of struggle and famine that they had to deal with as they sought to reclaim previously plundered land. They never achieved complete political autonomy. And when they got a little close too close for the comfort of those who were over them, they were always resubjugated by the power who was ever in power, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians. And in 70 AD, just a few decades after Jesus ascended back to his heavenly throne, the city and the temple in Jerusalem were once again destroyed, obliterated by the Roman army. Some kind of permanent restoration, huh? And so if it were not for that prophetic perspective, that knowledge that sometimes God speaks of multiple fulfillments, we might think that God had failed. That's blasphemy. I'm not suggesting that. God didn't, and God never does fail in any of his promises. If we think he did, then in reality, we fail to understand the promise of this shepherd prince to perfectly shepherd his flock. Because the promise of return was never intended to have the sheep at the center, but always the shepherd himself. From the very beginning of the children of Israel's history, Jesus, the shepherd prince, was the center, the heart of the story. Think about it. When God called Abram, the ancestor, the forefather of the Jews, to go to the promised land and start a nation, the call included with it a specific promise that through Abram's descendant, All nations of the earth would be blessed. That descendant was Jesus, the shepherd prince of all believers, both Jew and Gentile, through faith. When God took that young shepherd David and made him king over a united Israel, it wasn't really about David. It was about God giving his people now a leader who would lead with God's own heart and to whom yet another promise was made to David that one day, Your greatest descendant, David, would rule on your throne forever and ever. It's a promise God gave to David. David's rule came to an end, and his body rests in a grave somewhere. We don't know where, but somewhere he's dead. His body is. Jesus, the shepherd prince from the line of David, however, 
is the fulfillment of the promise to Ezekiel. David, through his greatest descendant, Christ, reigns over us now, his people. And so when God made his promises through Ezekiel, if we see the shepherd at the center of the narrative, then we realize God, the ruler of all of history, has indeed perfectly kept all of his promises to, to Israel and to us. Listen again to verses 15, 16, 23, and 24. I myself will shepherd my flock, and I myself will let them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will shepherd them in justice. Then I will raise up over them one shepherd, and he will tend them, my servant David. He will tend them, and he will be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be the prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Did you hear all the eyes? It's a little repetitive, but God was making a point. I'm going to do this. I will be their shepherd. And he calls this shepherd David. But of course, he is referring to Jesus from the line of David. So every time our Savior seeks out a believer today who's gone astray, but once again, brings them back. Every time the shepherd scoops that person up in his arms and through the gospel restores them to the flock, the promise of the perfect shepherd prince is fulfilled among us today. Every time your heart is weighed down with guilt from your sin and you feel you cannot go on any further because you're so incredibly weak, when Jesus, your shepherd prince, reminds you of his love for you, and graciously strengthens you through the word of a brother or sister in Jesus, or an uplifting song of praise, or a reading from God's word, the promise of the perfect shepherd prince is fulfilled among you. Every time a little child is brought out of darkness and into light through the work of the spirit of Jesus in their baptism, the promise of the perfect shepherd prince has been kept for the lambs of this congregation. Every time we celebrate a Christian funeral, recognizing that yet another one of his sheep has been guided safely through the valley of the shadow of death and into the perfect pastures of eternity. The promise of the perfect shepherd prince reaches a glorious peak among us. It's never been about the sheep. It's always been about the shepherd, who is a prince, the son of God, the king of the universe, the savior who never fails us when earthly leaders have. That was the vision given to Ezekiel and which was passed on to messianic believers of every generation. From Abraham to David, from the exile to Christ, from Christ until now, the shepherd prince has perfectly shepherded his people. He's done it through the gospel promises, and he's always done it perfectly. And one day, when this present heaven and earth pass away, and Christ shepherds in the new heaven and the new earth, on that day, there will be that perfect, ultimate, and forever fulfillment that has eluded us since the dawn of sin in this world. At that time, at, at times in our darkest moments, we might be tempted to think that the promises have failed. But that isn't true. God never fails. Jesus, your shepherd prince, has always been with you, and he will be with you forever. You have his word on it and he keeps his word. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Savior, your Shepherd Prince, Jesus. Amen. At this time, I ask the congregation to please stand as we continue with the Create in Me on page 6.
time we continue with the prayer of the church. Uh, it's not printed in your worship folder. I'll be reading a prayer of the church, and we'll be including a couple of special prayers. Um, one will be, again, from this book. We're going to pray um, for the safety of our armed forces. I thought this was appropriate because you read a lot in the news right now that with transitions from one administration to the next, it's kind of a risky time. And so we'll ask the Lord to bless our armed forces in this time of transition. Then also a prayer of thanksgiving on behalf of June Stephan, who, since she tested positive for COVID-19, has tested negative twice and is now out of isolation, whether she didn't have it ever, it was a false positive, or recovered amazingly, is immaterial. The Lord blessed her with good health, and she's now back in her room. So we thank God for that. We pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, once again we have enjoyed the privilege of gathering in this house of worship to hear your holy and precious word. May its message of salvation through Christ stir up our hearts to faith and love and produce the full fruits of good works in our lives. May we not forget your word which we have heard or bring shame upon it by our lips speaking against it, our hearts not believing it, or our lives not obeying it. Keep your word in the minds and hearts of our loved ones not present with us this day, and return them soon to this flock. Through the Spirit, open the, shep the scriptures more and more to our understanding that we might know you better, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save us. Father, we greatly need the comfort your word brings us. We are by nature sinful, and our flesh is continually opposed to your will. We often find that we act against you and your commandments, doing the very things you forbid and neglecting the things you command. We justly deserve eternal separation from you in hell, but we plead your love and mercy, which is revealed to this world of sinners in your word. Oh, let the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, blot our sins from your memory and present us faultless before you. Our only plea is that you forgive us for his sake. There is nothing that we desire more than eternal life through his merits and mediation. Father, from your word, we know that your heavenly throne is a throne of grace and that Jesus, our Savior, intercedes for us there. To it we come, burdened with our worries, our cares, and our needs, our sorrows, troubles, and illnesses. We ask that you would bless us by your counsel and aid, and relieve us of our many burdens according to your will. We know you are a God so gracious and merciful, so near to us when we pray, and so quick to respond to our pleas. Why then should we be fearful or anxious about our future? O oh, Father, according to your own promises, bless us now and always. For Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. Heavenly Father, praise and thanks to you for defending and protecting us by the sword you have entrusted to our government. Be with all those who serve in our armed forces. Prepare them well for the work they must do. Give them courage, strength, and endurance. As they travel by land, sea, or air, keep them safe. If they must serve far from their homes and their loved ones, cheer them with the assurance of your presence. If they must go into battle, spare their lives and preserve them from harm. Grant that our armed forces are given the personnel, the weapons, the equipment, and the supplies they need to do their work safely and effectively, and help us all find ways to show our support for them. Hear us for the sake of your Son, our Savior. Amen. And Lord, lastly, we lift up our hearts in thanksgiving for our sister June Stephan, who has... Uh, been tested negative twice now for COVID-19. We thank you that you have preserved her, her life and her health completely through this brush with the virus. We know that virus was in uh, that facility and whether or not you preserved her by keeping it from her or getting her through it, we thank you that you have done it. It is your, your accomplishment and we give you praise and thanks for it together with her and ask that you would continue to be with her and preserve her health, as well as the health and safety of all who live with her and the caregivers who take care of them. We thank you for this as a blessing from your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. And we join together in the prayer your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with hymn 351 on page 11. for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now receive with believing hearts the blessing of your triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
morning. morning. Welcome to our worship again. To those who are online, we thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I have just a few announcements. I'm going to try to do the two that I promised to do for others that I forgot last night and feel bad about. One is uh, there is a sign-up sheet for poinsettias to uh, sponsor them to beautify our sanctuary for Christmas uh, and Advent. So um, see the sign-up sheet in the narthex on the um, little ledge desk out there to the right as you exit. Also, um, so thank you to many of you who returned the surveys related to our, our potential possible future building project. Um, it's something that uh, we got a pretty good participation, but many of you aren't, are, are listening online. And so what we've done is if, if something was in your mailbox and you hadn't yet taken it out, we mailed it out uh, this week. So those of you who maybe haven't been able to pick it up will be able to receive it, read it, consider what is asked, uh, and if you're able to respond. Um, that came with a self-addressed envelope. So that means you'll be allowed to return it anonymously. That was the intent. Um, it'll have a return address uh, for the church, both in the address and return spot. So it can be just as anonymous as those who, who participated here in the sanctuary. All right, those are the two that I wanted to do because I had forgotten to do them yesterday for others. Um, so now on to our week. It's not a real crowded week except for one prominent event, and that is our Thanksgiving Eve worship, which is here at 7 p.m. There is a identical service at Faith at 5.30 p.m. So if for some reason that would work better for some of you, um, we'll be having worship at Faith at 5.30, same as here at 7. We'd love to have you. And for those who are watching online or those here who might be away, I plan to live stream the 7 o'clock service for Thanksgiving Eve. So that will be here, 7 p.m. this Wednesday evening, Central Time. So, all right, that's all that I believe I have. Um, yeah, I did my duty now. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to put on a mask. I'll sanitize my hands because I know I coughed into them once or twice. And I'll make sure I'm nice and clean and then I'll come out and greet you. So thank you very much and God bless you. <laughs> 